So in order for man to be truly tested, God needs to put him into a situation that required him to make a choice. And a very difficult choice. He had to choose between either deliberately disobeying God on the one hand, or sacrificing something that was as dear as life to him on the other. Because again, Adam was untested. Uh, he was innocent. Okay. Uh, he was perfect in the sense of the fact that there was no corruption uh, had come into the world at that point. But he was untested, and he was given a free will, and that is one of the great key uh, elements of understanding salvation, regardless of uh, in which dispensation it occurred, uh, the fact that man has a free will to choose. So God, to bring about this testing of man, first of all, created an adversary for Adam. Uh, this adversary had to be someone who would both hate God and man, uh, so much so to such an extent that he would go to any length to hurt either one of them. Now, Lucifer was the fifth cherub. Uh, we won't go over there, but Isaiah chapter 14 tells us about Lucifer. Uh, and he was placed over the earth when it was first created. He was its king, and he was ruler over its inhabitants, which were the angels. As we know, again, Isaiah 14, uh, Lucifer... Uh, who is now known as Satan and the devil, fell through the sin of pride. Now he was cast out of his position as the covering cherub. Good morning, brother. Good morning. In heaven. Uh, he also lost his position as king and ruler over earth and the angels. Uh, when this occurred, God destroyed the earth with a literal universal flood, flooded the entire universe, destroyed the entire universe. The angels were taken uh, to heaven to be with God there, which uh, became the third heaven. Earth was recreated as were the heavens, and the heavens were divided into three chambers, if you will. First heaven, which is the earth's atmosphere. Man cannot live outside of this atmosphere. Not yet. And that's an important thing. Well, again, man, mortal man, isn't going to be able to live outside of that atmosphere. God did this for a reason. Second heaven would be our universe, or what sometimes people refer to as outer space, uh, where man can not naturally live. Now, man has tried artificially to go out there, but he's not going to get very far. God's not going to let him. Because God's not going to let him corrupt <laughs> the universe. Uh, and God did this to keep man and to keep sin contained here on the earth. And then there is the third heaven, which is where God dwells, where he's taken the angels to be. The four cherubim and the seraphim are there. And God separated the third heaven from the other two by a frozen sea. Uh, the universe is a vacuum. The universe is a vacuum whose temperature is absolute zero. And to measure absolute zero, they use the Kelvin scale. Okay. So Kelvin zero would be the equivalent of minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 273 degrees Celsius. But it's still cold. A lot colder than it is today. At least you wouldn't know. <laughs> no, you, you wouldn't know. You freeze instantly. No, you wouldn't know. Uh, this, that's why I say man cannot exist naturally uh, in the vacuum of space, and God has done this deliberately. Uh, this is also sometimes referred to as either the glassy sea or the crystal sea. That comes from Revelation chapter 6 and verse 4. Uh, 
and again, God's done this to separate himself from any possibility of having sin come into his presence. He will not allow it. Now, Satan is permitted, actually he's ordered to report to God when summoned. Okay, but he is not allowed to dwell in heaven and he is not allowed to access third heaven at will. So that's the only time that he has that. And we know that from reading in, in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. But for right now, Satan is free to move about the first and the second heaven and also on the surface of the earth. Let's look at a few verses here. Ephesians 2, verses 2, 3, and 4. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2, 3, 4. Where in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, is who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he hath loved us. And, uh, but again, it's the reference to the prince of the power of the air. Uh, again, I mentioned Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. Let's go over there. And... and Read those verses. Job 1 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And he repeats that in Job 2 2. Right, so, Prince of the Power of the Air is also walking to and fro and up and down in the earth. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. Second Corinthians 4.4 4. And whom the God of this world, little g, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, capital G, should shine unto them. And then Isaiah 27 1. Prophet Isaiah chapter 27 and the first verse. There myself here. In that day the Lord with his sore, great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. And he's not talking about any ocean on this planet. Okay, he's talking about outer space, that sea. All right. Satan's hatred for God comes from his being dethroned for being banished and because he was replaced by mankind. That is his number one reason for hating humanity because man took his place. You know, and again, as a megalomaniac, you know, as a completely uh, self-centered, self worshiping individual uh, I mean, it, it just drives him crazy and it, that is the driving force behind all that he does his hatred for God and his hatred for man and we've got to remember okay, hell was created for the devil and his angels and not for man that's in Matthew chapter 25 verse 41 okay and again, you know, looking at that from the subject that we're studying here, okay? Hell was created for the devil and his angels, not for man. No man has ever had to go to hell. 
in every single dispensation, irregardless of what it was that God has revealed to man and therefore you know, what he required of them to do in order to be found righteous in God's eyes, if they obeyed this, then they would be found righteous in God's eyes and would not wind up in hell. Now, until Christ came, they would have been in paradise, in the center of the earth. Now, during the church age, the soul goes directly to heaven uh, in the tribulation the soul uh, is going to go to paradise, which is going to be in heaven. Uh, and same thing in the millennial reign. But eventually, though all those who are found righteous, irregardless again of the particular dispensation in which they are in, are going to be found uh, righteous, the great white throne judgment, uh, except for the church, uh, we're only there as witnesses, then they will have full access to God in every possible way. Now, when Adam falls, he learns a very, very difficult lesson here as to what it is going to cost to salvage him, Eve, and their offspring, their souls, from eternal damnation an internal damnation that they have justly earned and deserved. Now, now, I mean, he did this. Again, he had to make a choice. He would either deliberately disobey God or lose Eve, his wife. Yeah. And the choice he made was to throw himself on the mercy of God and he deliberately failed, hoping that God would do something to save them both. Uh, but let's go over there. Genesis 3, first of all. Genesis 3, verses 15 through 24. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And this is the first promise here of that woman's seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now to Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Yeah, I mean, that's then it's no different today. Yeah. Life is full of sorrow. That is the result of sin. Thorns also and thistles shalt it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coat, make skins, make coats of skins and clothe them. Yeah. There was a lesson. First time they saw anything, die. God and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. Now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And he learned some tough lessons here. He learned some tough lessons uh, for the result, what it was going to take. Uh, basically, nothing man could do. He's saying, there's nothing you're going to be able to do that's good. until the woman's seed comes, there's nothing you can do. Go to the next chapter in Genesis. Pick it up, verse 3. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and the ground that God had cursed. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, okay. like what God killed to make coats of skin 
and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So not only did they die spiritually and lose their relationship with God, but they began to die physically as well. The paradise that they lived in uh, is cursed, and so ends the ease of life. Okay? Life is going to be a struggle. Life is going to be a burden. Life is going to be difficult. Life is going to be hard. That's the simple fact of it. Okay? Procreation now results in difficult pregnancies, and they occur with greater frequency uh, because of her weakness in uh, yielding when she, when she was beguiled. She's now under the authority of her husband. And he carries the responsibility to watch over and to guide her and their household. Falls on him. Remember how Adam tried to blame Eve? God said, oh no. <laughs> no, falls on you. Okay. And the only means of paying for their sin was through their own blood. Their blood. Human blood. Now God had promised a woman's seed who would free them from their enemy and tormentor when he came. In the meantime, okay, to remind men of their situation and to remind them of their obligation and the price to be paid for their rebellion against God, God required men to sacrifice an innocent lamb, a substitute. Okay. As often as God required, could be yearly, doesn't really say. Okay, but this was done only as a temporary covering for their sin. A remittance. That's what a remittance is. It's a temporary covering. It doesn't pay for it. You know, it's like a promissory note, you know. Uh, and this is a situation that persisted right up until the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Noah, you know, continue with that commandment. Genesis chapter 8, verse 15. Genesis 8, 15 to the end of the chapter. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Job, Job, uh, not only continued with the commandment, but carried it well beyond what was required to ensure righteousness. Go to Job chapter 1, verse 5. Job was constantly sacrificing before God. And so it was when the days of their feastings were gone about every week, 
they did this in their order, that Job sent and, sacri and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart. And thus did Job continually. Never mind, you know, maybe it was once a year, whatever it was that God required. God, and he's doing this every week. <laughs> every week. He is offering up these sacrifices to God. Abraham also follows along. Abraham and Job were probably contemporaries. Uh, Genesis 12, 7. Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. The Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he built it an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he follows that commandment. And he taught the same to Isaac. Isaac taught it to Jacob. Jacob taught it to his 12 sons. Now, interestingly, if we go to Genesis 17, we get a new revelation. We get a something new is dispensed to man. It's dispensed to Abraham and Abraham's descendants. And that's Genesis 17, verses 9 through 14. A new requirement for the descendants of Abraham. Genesis 17, 9 through 14. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money, or any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Now this is specific to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants, not anybody else. Okay, so he is given a new revelation. He is given a covenant specific to him, uh, the covenant of circumcision, and it's passed down to all of his descendants. That's why you have not just Jews, but any of the descendants of Ishmael, uh, your Arabic peoples, all right, who also keep this covenant. It is specific to them. It was required of them in order to be righteous in the eye that they broke that covenant. Doesn't matter if they were doing the sacrifices, they broke that covenant. You know, all bets are off. They find themselves in hell. So we have some more revelation that's been given here. And that's an important thing to remember, okay? Because that circumcision is a type of the spiritual circumcision made without hands, okay? As performed by the Holy Spirit of God at our salvation, cutting our soul and our spirit away from our still corrupt flesh. That's Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11. Now, that truth and the understanding of that truth in relation to this isn't revealed to anybody at all until Paul receives that revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ uh, when he is spending those three years in the Arabian desert. Uh, go over to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter 1, 10, 11, and 12. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what? 
Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow? Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desired to look into. And the prophets, a lot of time, the prophecies that they gave through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they had no idea what it was they were saying. It made no sense to them. You know, and they would pray about it, and they would try to search what they had. For, but a lot of times, a lot of what was being given to them, they had no idea what it was. They did, they couldn't make any connection there because they didn't know anything at all about the Word of God becoming a man. They knew nothing at all about Him going to the cross. They knew nothing about him suffering from man's sin. They knew nothing about him dying, going to hell, being resurrected. They didn't know any of this. It wasn't until Christ revealed these things to Paul. Okay? And again, what does he have? It's that Old Testament. Okay, New Testament hasn't even been written yet. Okay, And God is revealing to Paul these mysteries and the mystery here of circumcision the illustration of what it is the typology there of being cut away from our flesh okay. they had no idea what it was and okay God says to do this we'll do it yeah. uh, no deeper understanding of other than the fact that God said this is going to be the token of my covenant with you the pro what's the covenant that he's made with Abraham he promised Abraham and his descendants the kingdom he promised them the land that's the covenant that he made with them that the land where you're wandering now as pilgrims and strangers one day is going to be your own and that's the token of that uh, covenant is that fleshly circumcision. Okay, but for us, and why it's so important, I mean, this is why I say you've got to know the Old Testament. You've got to know the Old Testament so that when you read the New Testament, these things become clear to you. What's our promise? What's our inheritance? What is our kingdom? The spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God. It's the new Jerusalem. And, uh, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's the covenant of that promise made to us? It's our spiritual circumcision. We have to walk around in this flesh in order to fulfill God's will here on this earth. But we have the earnest, the down payment promise of getting a glorified body and the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. And it is Him who has cut us away. And again, the Holy Spirit of God is God. Therefore, he can't have any contact with sin. So he dwells inside our spirit, our soul, but the flesh has been cut away from us, so it cannot corrupt our soul. You know? And, you know, many of the requirements of God's different dispensings aren't going to be understood in this respect understood plainly until it's revealed to Paul and of course this is what makes Paul so important in his apostleship 
uh, the apostle to the Gentiles is all these truths are delivered to him and then of course he is used to write you know uh, quite a bit of the New Testament and that Paulian doctrine as we call it uh, is what makes plain for us the understanding of these things God has deliberately hid them from men until after his son Jesus Christ had come uh, and accomplished the very critical work of paying for the sins of humanity um, being the promised woman's seed back in Genesis chapter 3 let's go to one more verse 2 Corinthians 3 2 Corinthians chapter 3 12 to 18 Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as most.